Hey everyone, this is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the intelligent social media platform where you can find all sorts of articles, books, and discussions that are relevant to a classically liberal education. I'm back today with Dr. Jonathan Cook, and we are going to be talking about Miss Revenel's Conversion by John William DeForest. Actually has a longer title, uh, which we'll get into. Uh, but without further ado, let me just introduce Dr. Jonathan Cook, and maybe you can begin by telling us something about DeForest. Who was he? Yeah, so John William DeForest is is one of the great um, overlooked authors in American literature, particularly in the 19th century, uh, because he um, he wrote really the best book on the Civil War, the best uh, novel historically based on the war by someone who fought in it. And uh, unfortunately, the book didn't, I mean, it got a lot of critical praise when it came out in 1867, but it kind of disappeared uh, after a few years. And DeForest, uh, he pretty much had decided to become a writer with that book, I mean, he'd written um, a novel before that, um, but he threw in his lot as a novelist. And he was really, I mean, in the early 1870s, William Dean Howells considered him the best American novelist, you know, before the emergence of Twain or Henry James or, you know, Howells himself. Uh, but during the 1870s, he kept publishing, but he, his reputation never really took off. So um, he really had to give up writing in the in the eighteen uh, eighties, and he lived in uh, New Haven, you know, as an older man. Finally, died. You know, his dates are eighteen twenty six to nineteen o four. No, I'm sorry, eighteen nineteen o six. So he he lived to be eighty. Uh, he was from New Haven or the New Haven area, and he died in New Haven, uh, kind of embittered by his lack of success. There are really some interesting parallels with Melville here because he had a big uh, critical success and a certain amount of financial success, but then couldn't hold on to his reputation, even though he published a lot more fiction and uh, uh, he even wrote, published some poetry at the end of his life. And he did a fair amount of journalism as well. So. I mean, to get an idea of his whole life, he was born in outside New Haven. Uh, DeForest is a Huguenot name, so, but his Huguenot ancestors came to Connecticut in the 17th century. So he began. He belonged to an old, established family. His father was a cotton, cotton uh, merchant, um, and a paper manufacturer as well. And DeForest was going to go to Yale, but he got a typhoid fever in his late teens, so he he went over to the uh, to Lebanon to stay with his brother, who was a medical missionary over there, and he spent a couple of years in Lebanon recovering his health. Then he came back to the U.S. in the late 1840s. He wrote a history of the uh, Indians of Connecticut, a sort of anthropological study, historical study, which he published uh, in 1850. Um, which uh, people still think is really one of the first um, uh, really impartial uh, overviews of colonial Indian relations in Connecticut. And then in the 1850s, later in the 1850s, he published two books of travels. One was about his travels in the Eastern Mediterranean called Oriental Acquaintance, um, and involves a lot about life in Syria, Beirut, and um, it's very entertaining, enjoyable, interesting. Uh, there's a sort of light tone to it, um, and still very readable today. You can you know find it on uh, uh, you know Google Books. And then he wrote another book uh, called European Acquaintance about his travels around Europe in the um, early 1850s when he was back in Europe. Then he got married in 1856 to the daughter of a professor of chemistry 
at the University of South Carolina in Charleston, who's kind of the model for Dr. Ravenel. Um, his wife's, uh, his wife's uh, maiden name was Shepard, and his wife's father was actually a cousin, the first cousin of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who happened to end up teaching in South Carolina, and he was also at Amherst. He had a kind of joint appointment. So then DeForest was married. He was actually in Charleston when the firing of Fort Sumter and had to leave on the last boat um, because he was staying with his wife's family down there. And he came back to New Haven. And then he uh, volunteered to serve after Bull Run in the fall of 1861. He uh, joined a, uh, he raised a, actually a company of Connecticut uh, volunteers and form part of the 12th Connecticut um, uh, unit that would fight. They were actually shipped down to New Orleans. And he, uh, you know, he had a lot of the experiences that you find uh, Edward Colburn having in the book. He wrote lots of letters, uh, that is, um, um, DeForest wrote letters back to his wife in New Haven, and he used a lot of those letters as a basis for sort of putting together his book, um, took ideas and experiences from, from that, that, um, uh, those letters. Uh, but anyway, he, he was slightly wounded and then, uh, but then got malaria and finally returned to New Haven in, um, uh, December, 1864. Then he, and then he went back to Washington as a um, as an officer in the um, <clears throat> uh, Veteran Reserve Corps in Washington D.C. Right at the end of the Civil War, you know, to to make sure that the uh, there was an orderly withdrawal of troops and there wasn't flare-ups of fighting again. So he he served in Washington from the summer of 1865 to. Uh, about the middle of 1866. Then he went down and through 1867 he was an officer in the Freedmen's Bureau in Greenville, South Carolina, administering that uh, office and, uh, you know, revisiting the post-war South uh, that he knew from his own, uh, his wife's family. Uh, um, <clears throat> and that's when he wrote uh, Miss Ravenel's conversion. He wrote it from about sixty-five, sixty-six, um, and it was finally it was published in the spring of sixty-seven, eighteen sixty-seven. Um, and as I said, after that, he um, early eighteen seventies, um, he wrote more fiction. He wrote a a very good book about the the uh, South just before the Civil War called Kate Beaumont. He wrote two political satires called Honest John Vane and uh, Playing the Mischief. Um, he wrote a, uh, a novel about uh, romantic intrigue in Lebanon and Beirut called Irene the Missionary. A very entertaining book uh, based on his own experiences there living uh, a, a while earlier. And then kind of his career puttered out in the 1880s. Uh, he wrote a book called The Bloody Chasm about um, the post-war, you know, problems of reconciliation. Um, so, you know, he's one of these writers who uh, really never got the audience that he deserved. And uh, critics uh, liked his work. I mean, they, the more he wrote, the more sort of mixed his reviews were, but he just couldn't sell enough books, just like Melville couldn't sell enough books to keep going as a writer. So the last two, 25 years of his life, he pretty much was not writing at all. Um, anyway, so that's a brief overview of his life. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, I have so many questions. Um, so what was, what is always really exciting for me when we're, when we have these conversations on Noetic or when I introduce audiobooks for Noetic is when I, take an overview of what already exists on the internet yeah, and see like, you know, how will this stack up against, you know, previously existing conversations and recordings. There's there, Almost this nothing. book has, yeah. there's nothing on this. <laughs> this book has not been turned into an audiobook by anyone. I, 
yeah. I had infinite resources and infinite time, I would read it myself because it is a wonderful book. He's a fantastic stylist. And, uh, you know, I, I believe he, you said, I think you alluded to this earlier. He was an innovator in American realism. Yeah. Uh, it's, it seems like to me that he, it, in a little bit of research that I was able to do, it seems like people were high on him for a while. Like I even read some reviews that some people were comparing him to Tolstoy. Yeah. Yeah. And, but then it seemed like he was supplanted by Stephen Crane and then yeah. the red badge of courage right. kind of became the thing that was like part of the American educational curriculum. And yeah. this fell by the wayside. Yeah. And I, I, why do we only just, why do we get to just have one <laughs> book about well, the civil war that everyone reads? Why can't we have two? Well, the, the thing is, uh, some of this, well, there are two reasons for this. One is, first of all, Stephen Crane, you know, Red Badge of Courage, it's 120 pages, much easier to fit into a college curriculum. Uh, Miss Ravenel's Conversion, 450 pages, uh, much more of an investment of time and energy. Um, and uh, so... Uh, you know, I think courses in colleges, if they exist on the Civil War, would definitely include this book. But if you're doing a survey course on American literature in the 19th century, you're not gonna you're not gonna put this book. You're gonna you're gonna settle with with Crane because it's a lot easier and it's, it's a you know more modernist text. But the other thing is that this book was published at a time when you know it was still true that young women were the primary consumers of novels and they determine the market so right after the civil war you want you know there was still a prejudice against books that were too realistic that exposed too much of the horrors of war and the book i don't think it got popular because people just didn't want to hear about um, what the war was like in any real detail um, I mean, they wanted to read about the romantic aspect, and that's very, you know, it's a wonderful love story. But even that has some risque aspects to it because it includes, uh, you know, the dis representation of adultery by one of the two major male characters. So <clears throat> it got pushed aside because of sort of the genteel... Uh, rules of publishing in the 18, late 1860s, 1870s. And then um, when readership got a little more sophisticated in the 1890s and Crane's book became popular, um, it was kind of left high and dry as a, as a sort of forgotten war book. And, and uh, DeForest publishers didn't give him any breaks because <coughs> um, the Harper's... Um, the Harper Brothers, I mean, they were one of the big publishers in New York. Originally, they were supposed to serialize it in Harper's Monthly magazine, which would have given him a lot more attention. Uh, but instead, when they found out that there was some adultery in the book and some, some serious misbehavior by the characters and s implications of sexual immorality, they said, no, we're, we're just going to publish this book um, by itself as a, as, a, as a novel, not as a serial. So, plus, they did a terrible job of typesetting, so there were lots of typos in the book that was published in 1867 because they could not send the page proofs to, um, to Forrest, who was down on the Freedmen's Bureau in Greenville, South Carolina. It was just it was too hard to send him that um, uh, uh, those proofs, and so it was allowed to be published in a terrible format. And um, f you know, I think DeForest got upset. It was published in five thousand copies, and I, I think it only sold one or two thousand copies in the first year or so. Even though uh, William Dean Howells thought it was the best novel of the Civil War and praised him to the skies, you know, he was. He was working at the Atlantic Monthly at that point, and he had a lot of uh, influence in his opinion. But you know, he couldn't change the whole public's opinion um, in terms of getting them to accept this book. So, uh, yeah, I, I think when people read this book, they're just blown away because it is so uh, engrossing and really takes you into the wartime experience because it, it's just so. 
it has a kind of a such a panoramic view of the war because you begin right with Fort Sumter and you and you end with the end of the war and you you hear about uh, the occupation of New Orleans you hear about the combat going on you hear about the political corruption that affects the war you hear about procurement corruption the way Carter uh, who's trying to make money wants to um, do some contraband selling of cotton uh, you know from um, southerners who want to sell to the government and then that falls through and then he has to arrange this deal to sell these government steamboats and then and then buy them again uh, pretending that they were needed after all and they've been refurbished and then they have to actually burn the steamboats to uh, cover their tracks in terms of um, the the hundred thousand dollars that Carter was able to arrange through this bogus uh, deal that he did. So you 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 learn so many things about the Civil War that you you know you'd have to read several history books to to know in terms of combat experience, occupation experience, um, the experiment in. <clears throat> trying to educate the newly freed slaves and how that worked out, you know, the reconstruction experiment. So that that is what you get as a as a reader of this book and I, I think you I would hope that you would confirm that and, you know, add to what I said. I mean, what did you learn about the war when you read it? What struck out what struck out to you? Well, I can't I can't say I can't say that I learned, you know, I did so much work on that um, Battles and Leaders yeah, of the Civil War, right. yeah. uh, uh, that 3,000 page um, yeah. series of letters that spanned the, the entire. Show. So, but, but I had the same feeling I did as I was reading that, that it's so important to preserve these things and make sure that they don't go down the memory hole. Yeah. Um, because I, I think if, you're, if you are acquainted with the gritty realities of war, it it makes you so disinclined to go on foreign adventures. I hate war. Yeah, and I don't, I I, I don't like reading war books because I have some sort of fetish for death or, or blood or anything like that. But really, to drive home the point that like, you know, this is something to be avoided at all costs. Yeah. that's my. So so I think that's the biggest thing for me is that we hold this firmly in our memories so that we don't get involved in. Um, unnecessary military entanglements, e either within our own country or out outside of it. So, I, I, for me, it's just a reminder of that. Yeah. And then, and then also, you know, the the, re the I I take I'm very concerned about texts just being forgotten, like you are. Yeah. Hence why we're having this conversation. You know, it's it's just a tragedy when you see someone who's so such a gifted writer. Yeah. As the forest is. Yeah. And just to to just think about that all that stuff just collecting dust on yeah. some library somewhere and it not to be part of our lively intercourse with one another. Yeah. I, I just think reading the forest and reading reading the further back in time that you can go and read yeah. to Forrest or, or Virgil or whoever elevates the English language and yeah. really brings back uh, this, this fading art form of conversation and literature. Yeah. So these are the main things that motivate me as a modern reader uh, of to Forrest to, to, to why I'm an advocate for him. Yeah. Well, what I think needs to be emphasized is that he was one of the first writers like Henry James, to sort of break out of the American uh, provincial shell. Uh, I mean, he traveled as a, you know, he went over at the age of 20 to the Middle East, and then he went over to travel around Europe and spent three or four years in Europe. In the early 1850s, he knew French, Italian, Spanish, Latin, because um, he, he was sort of educated with tutors, um, and then self-educated him uh, you know with with foreign literature he's very very well read in French literature uh, in Balzac George Sand uh, Stendhal and I think he brings a very sophisticated literary sensibility like Henry James um, but in a much more sort of candid um, honest and 
sort of warm-hearted manner to his characters because he, yeah, he's a very good comic writer. I mean, he's he has a sort of humorous approach to character that is very forgiving, but very informed about human nature. And that's what I like about him. I mean, there's some great observations about the characters in Miss Ravenel that are the kinds of ins moral insights that you get in, say, George Eliot, um, or uh, another writer he, he, he followed was Thackeray. You know, he, he was very um, immersed in the important European fiction of his time. And I, and I think the Balzac influence shows up in the character of uh, Madame LaRue, who's, who's this devious uh, widow who seduces uh, Major uh, uh, Colonel Carter and uh, pretty much destroys the marriage of her, of her niece by having an affair with her husband, you know, just because she could do it. I mean, she did it just to show her power as a, as a beautiful, you know, 30 something year old woman living in New Orleans, right? It just, just shows you that, you know, women can be sexual predators just like men in, in the right circumstances. Um, well, what I was going to ask you was trying to, trying to parse where, where this book is autobiographical and where this book is influenced by the authors that you enumerated just a moment ago and where that, where in that Venn diagram, where, you know, where do we find Miss Ravenel? <clears throat> well, um, like, I mean, I mean, the, are these characters, they're pretty these much people, were well, these people that DeForest knew? Well, his uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Ravenel is based on his uh, divorced father-in-law. Lily is probably partly based on his wife Harriet, uh, who is very uh, well. There, there are a few differences, but um, we don't know that much about DeForest's life, and we know less about his wife, so we can't really make that many close parallels. But obviously, his wife did not have a previous marriage with. Uh, a guy like Carter, um, he invented that. But a lot of the descriptions of war, descriptions of uh, occupied New Orleans, the speeches that Dr. Ravenel gives about what it was like in the South before the Civil War, um, all of that is based on DeForest's own life. So I, I, I suppose you could say it's about half and half. But I mean, you know, he's considered a realist, so he's using his own experience as a template for writing a story that adheres to the reality of the Civil War and describing events very accurately the way he experienced them. I mean, if you read his letters, and he, he also wrote some articles about the Civil War for Harper's, um, he uh, he's, he's sort of paraphrasing what he said in the letters. He's using it, but he's not taking hunks of text and just throwing them into the book, you know, which is something that Hawthorne did occasionally. He took his journals and, uh, and um, used them for his, his uh, stories like, you know, the Blydale Romance, the, the drowning of Zenobia was based on an um, event that he witnessed when he lived in Concord, this young woman who drowned herself into the river, in the river next door. So, you know, DeForest is just being a smart guy by using the raw material that he created in his letters to his wife because he knew he was recording it for history. He, he kind of sat down and said, I'm going to keep an accurate record of my own experience as a soldier and what, what the whole experience of combat is like. And uh, so he, he had a very... Um, uh, you know, serious attitude about his experiences, almost as though he knew he was going to write something about the war. It's hard. We don't have any record about when he actually came up with the idea of writing a novel. He, he just began to write it as soon as he returned to New Haven in December 1864 when he was suffering from malaria. He was recovering for several weeks from, uh, from a serious sickness. And I wouldn't be, su I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know. I'm just guessing, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if he started scribbling it during the war. Don't you during think? the war, I mean, there, well, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of downtime. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, it. Well, I think, you know, he's probably writing his letters, maybe musing about how he could shape his experience into a story. But I think when he got home and he looked at his letters that he wrote back, he said, you know, he had all his letters there so he could just sort of put together whatever he came up with. Uh, I mean, the problem is sure. we, we have no record of it. Sure. Um, but well, I'll tell you, there's that uh, one scene that's coming to mind that doesn't seem like you could make it up where the where's the man who's against the tree and he's reading the newspaper. Yeah, right. I don't and want to spoil the, for yeah, people. And the bullet. That doesn't see, that yeah. seems like a real, that seems like something that, that is really exact. Happened. That happened. Yeah. It's in one of his letters. Um, yeah. Some of the, the combat wounds, definitely um, things that he transferred from his letters, the whole attack on Fort Hudson. And then the, and then the other attack when he rescues um, Dr. Ravenel and Lily takes them to the other fort and defends it. Um, those are very, the, the combat scenes there and the hospital scenes are very much um, dependent on his, his letters and, and some of his journalism about the war. In fact, you can read his, um, a selection of his letters and articles uh, was published in the late 1940s. It was called um, a Volunteer's Adventures. And he put that together um, later in his life, thinking that a publisher would issue it um, as a first person, you know, journalistic account of the war, uh, Harper's or anyone else, but no one published it. So he, his grandson gave it to Yale University. Uh, and then it was finally published by Yale University Press, I think in 18, uh, I'm sorry, 1949. But you can, you can get a, a, a paperback edition now. It was reprinted, and um, it's considered to be one of the foremost descriptions of combat amongst Civil War veterans uh, or Civil War writers. I mean, there's a book about Ambrose Bierce and DeForest and their descriptions of combat as something new in American literature um, that was, you know, published by an academic in the 1980s. So, you know, DeForest is getting some attention, but it's been very sporadic. And, uh, for instance, I was doing some research in JSTOR where you see all the scholarly articles on um, American literature, right? And how many articles do you think are on Miss Ravenel, under the the keyword, you know, Miss Ravenel, like six, um, which, I mean, is better than nothing, but still it's kind of ridiculous for a, a major novel about the Civil War. So this guy is way overdue for a, a major um, academic revaluation and rediscovery. It's astonishing. I mean, I, uh, you know, I use, I use, JSTOR, the public domain articles from JSTOR yeah. and feature them on Noetic. And, you know, so there was no one writing about, there's zero, there's zero on him up until 1924. So, yeah, I mean, 19, it's kind of like Melville, 19, the huge gap there, you know, in the beginning yeah. of the 20th century. Yeah. I So I imagine really the first critical commentary, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know if you have the, if you have the article dates in front of you, I wouldn't be surprised if someone didn't write a scholarly article about him until the forties or the fifties. Um, uh, yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Cause there well, was, there was nothing, yeah, there 40s, was nothing up to tw probably like Melva, you know, uh, just world war two was sort of the, uh, a catalyst for evaluation. But I mean, the interesting thing was that DeForest prepared a revised edition of Miss Ravenel's conversion where he he made the corrections to the um, corrupt uh, first edition of the book, and he, he changed some of the wording, and he took out the chapter titles. He was trying to make it more tolerable for, for the readership, he thought, that was around in the 1880s, but even Harper's didn't publish that, even. So he, uh, he, was, very, he was a very frustrated guy, I think, by the early 1880s, when he just... I wonder... Yeah. I wonder if uh, Gone with the Wind w helped bring helped the to repop. War. Well, yeah, I wonder if Gone with the Wind maybe repopularized mm -hmm. DeForest for some reason, and maybe that's why we 
it gets reintroduced around. I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just speculating. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's some connection between the movie and, and this book. Yeah. Well, anyone, why. any academic who read William Dean Howells's criticism read how much, uh, how highly he thought of John DeForest. He was his friend, you know, and, um, they, um, they would see that, Howells was saying, I mean, this guy is a great writer, you know, how come he doesn't have a big public? So anyone who knew Howells would say, hey, let's take a look at DeForest because Howells likes him. And Howells, of course, was Twain's champion and he was, you know, friends with Henry James, but he he really uh, helped integrate Twain into the canon of American literature. So Howells had a good sense of, you know, who is important as a writer. Um, so I don't know what the what the mystery is. I think one thing is we only in two thousand did we get a, a penguin uh, edition of the novel, and it's it's pretty good. It's got pretty good notes with this guy Jagari Sharnhorst as the editor. Um, so at least that was done in two thousand. Before that, I noticed you had the Reinhardt edition from the from I do. the nineteen oh. fifties. Oh. Eagle Eye, uh, look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that, yeah, my, I think that has from... a decent uh, editorial apparatus introduction. But yeah, that was, I mean, that shows that it was a potential book for college readership in the 1950s. And well, I'll tell you what, I, I think it still had a few typos in it. Really? In the Reinhardt edition. As yeah. a, I, I, not, not many, not many. I wouldn't discourage anyone from getting it, but I was familiar, I had read the preface and yeah. where it was beset with these uh, typesetting issues yeah. that you mentioned earlier. And I noticed that a few of them had even endured into the 1950s yeah. version. Yeah. So, yeah, man, you, you know, your editions, you could see that. <laughs> well, that's, you know, yeah. Was... Well, um, you know, I, I don't think I'm very familiar with the, with the Reinhardt publishing company. Um, yeah. That went out of existence in the sixties, I think, or seventies. It was, it was an important uh, reprint for classic literature for a uh, while in the 50s and okay. 60s. Um, okay. I forget where they were based. Uh, was it, I, I don't know if it was, uh, if it was Houghton Mifflin, was it Houghton Mifflin who was the, uh, uh, sponsored that? Was Holt Reinhardt and oh, Winston? Holt Reinhardt. Okay, Holt Reinhardt and Winston, Winston yeah. Incorporated, and it right. looks like they had they had offices all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Holt is still around, but those those uh, reprints uh, bit the dust. I think in the seventies. Did, did you I've, buy a copy, or did you get it from the library? I don't think the Li Loudoun County Library has a copy of it, unless no, it's... if I, I had, mine fell apart, so oh. <laughs> I would be buying it either way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I bought it off Amazon. Yeah. I have to. I should give a plug as far as um, uh, extant works go that are being republished. I found this great website called ForgottenBooks.com. Yeah, and a lot of uh, if you're interested, like Dr. Cook and I are in preserving um yeah. undervalued or great works of literature or whatever this is a this is a fantastic company that's sprung up that i highly recommend um they they take books that are in the public domain and yeah. they make very cheap and efficient print offs and i've been i've been ordering from them like crazy yeah, I, yeah you, I think i've gotten you know, i know them yeah you know, I've, I've gotten a couple of their books yeah yeah i mean it's 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 there aren't a lot of bells and whistles, but I mean, if you're wanting a physical copy for things where the copyright has expired yeah, and that you want to expose more people to, it's a great place to get them for cheap. Yeah. So I, we should probably move on to the thorny question about how DeForest fits in the whole slavery question. Um, yeah. Do you want to, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, one of the great joys of reading the book is, is hearing Dr. Ravenel's denunciations of slavery and how it has enslaved the minds of Southerners, right? The, just the ramifications of slavery in Southern society and, and just how it has degraded the poor whites and made them um, these um, uh, backers of the planter class who were the ones who were the <clears throat> well, the reason they're fighting the war is to defend the institution of slavery so these these rich planters could keep their their wealth 
Um, so you get a lot of very, I mean, progressive-minded comments about slavery from Dr. Ravenel, and, and Colburn pretty much buys into that, but he, as someone who, um, you know, had a sort of jaded soldier's eye view, he makes a couple of derogatory remarks about his servant Henry at one point, saying, I wish slavery would come back because my servant Henry is so irresponsible. But of course, he's making a joke of it. Um, but you could point out that DeForest was, uh, I mean, he was enlightened about the fact that African Americans had, in American society, had existed in this suffocating um, uh, atmosphere of prejudice, and that once you got rid of this, you could really see what this race could do as, as human beings. And uh, um, you see that when Dr. Ravenel is running this plantation with the, the black uh, freed slaves um, as an experiment. And in the beginning, everything is sort of chaotic, but there's sort of order emerges and people start acting more responsibly. And you have this Major Scott, who's sort of a, a comic um, character, but he turns out to be sort of a hero by saving, helping to save Dr. Ravenel and, and his, his daughter Lily as they retreat in the face of these Texas um, uh, Confederates who were who were approaching their plantation, you know. Um, so uh, DeForest, by today's standards, you could say he was sort of um, fell short to some extent. If you if you trace his views to Edward Colburn, but if you look at Dr. Ravenel's comments on slavery, you see him as incredibly forward-looking and not prejudiced and progressive-minded. Um, so you kind of you have to keep that uh, balance in mind as you read it, but you don't find anything that shows any kind of rank uh, prejudicial attitude that reflects anything by the author, you know. What I, I'm just cu I'm curious about your perspective on this as a scholar of American literature. Um, we were speaking off air earlier earlier about what we'll likely cover next is this um, yeah. Melville text, and that is, I think you mentioned that it's re revelatory of maybe Melville's attitudes on on the slavery question. Um, it seems like, at least within scholarly circles, if if these writers from the 19th century or even the 18th century or something like that, if they came down on the wrong side of this issue or weren't like yeah. a very zealous abolitionist, yeah. that, that, uh, that affects how we receive them today. Well, and I guess, yeah, I, I guess I wonder if that's, I guess I, well, if you, I, 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 I look, I would have been, if I existed back then, I probably would have been one of these fanatical abolitionists, but, if they weren't, it doesn't so much affect my estimation of of the book. And, and I'm, I guess I'm just thinking out loud. Maybe it ought to. I don't know. What do you think? Well, when you read books that show a sort of naked abhorrence of, of African-Americans and prejudice, uh, I mean, you know, there were books like that in the late 19th century, early 20th century, you know, the, the, the Klansmen and... Uh, uh, the, I mean, that was the book that uh, Birth of a Nation was based on. Uh, there was a real, um, uh, very vicious sort of school of fiction from the late 19th century from the South that was sort of trying to refute the, the idea of integrating Southern society with, with you know, freed blacks. Um, and you can't, really can't read that without just uh, abhorrence and, and the naked prejudice that's shown by the, by the writer and the depiction, the false depiction of, of um, African Americans. I think that the, the strength of Miss Ravenel's conversion is that you see a range of attitudes towards African Americans. I mean, Carter, Major Carter, right? He, he's a Virginian, but he joins the Union side. He's almost like a Robert E. Lee character who, you know, who went to West Point. Uh, but then he 
he wants to fight with the Union. Um, even though he spent some time and a lot of time in the South and led a filibuster expedition at one point with some other Southerners, you know, that, that happened in the late 1850s. But so he has a very contemptuous attitude about blacks, but he's still fighting for the Union. Colburn has a sort of a mixed attitude. He's an abolitionist, but he personally, he, um, he finds fault with his servant and he makes some derogatory comments about some other uh, blacks in the book, but nothing showing any kind of uh, intolerance and, and deep prejudice. And then you have Dr. Ravenel, who presents a kind of 20th century liberal's attitude towards race. Um, and so you get, you get a whole spectrum representing what people were thinking at the time. You know, I mean, the abolitionists, of course, were a tiny group at the beginning of the war, and most Union soldiers were fighting to restore the Union. They weren't fighting to free the slaves. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's an historical fact, whether you like that or not. Um, but uh, so it it's, it's presents an historical event with impartiality and, and realism. And, and I think that's why it's such a great book, because we can read it and learn about what people were thinking on the race issue. But, of course, there are no important African-American characters in the book. They're all sort of peripheral. Um, but um, there is reference to the Creoles, you know, the mixed French an African American population of Louisiana, and the fact that Colburn visits Creole families and thinks they're very distinguished and they're very um, tied in with French culture, and then when he tells his wife about it, she's kind of a whore, uh, thinks it's terrible because you know she grew up in Louisiana and there was a, pr a huge dividing line between the white population and the mixed blood. You know, there's a whole ranking system that. You can read about in um, um, uh, in some other later books. Uh, the Grandissimus, uh, the Grandissimi is a is a book uh, novel about taking on that very issue. Um, and um, so, uh, on the matter of race, you're you're really uh, you know like Harry Peter Stowe. You're getting a sort of cross a spectrum of attitude to, uh, of race but the author is sympathetic to abolitionism uh, but as a white person still has some residual prejudices that you know may show up here or there yeah it's interesting about how we how we use our aesthetic judgment if we're you know we're applying our standards to works of art from the past yeah. And they're not measuring up morally, but measure, maybe they're measuring up aesthetically. Do we cast them aside? I think it's an interesting ph philosophy of literature question, and I'm sure it's taken up by someone somewhere. I'm just kind of spontaneously thinking about it here. But I'll derail our conversation. Yeah. Le I what just, about... The, what let about me just the, add, the, oh, sure. the, on the issue of the Creole, uh, the prejudice against Creoles, George Washington Cable, he was a friend of uh, Twain's, uh, Louisiana, New Orleans writer in the late eight, the 19th century, uh, took on that issue of the terrible dividing line between uh, having a tiny bit of African blood, you know, and then um, being totally cut off from the white, the pure white society, you know. Anyway, what were you going to say? Well, <clears throat> I was going to move on to I, this. I don't know if this would be our, I'm sure. We'll see. We'll see if this is our penultimate or ultimate yeah. question of the interview here. Yeah. But if you could speak to the possibility of Miss Revenel being, and by the way, I should say the whole title here. It's yeah. uh, Miss Revenel's conversion from secession to loyalty. Right. It, it, talk about how this book represents sort of a romance of reconciliation. Yeah. Well, that's that, that's a title that's kind of given to it. It's kind of labeled that. Yeah, well, contemporary historians have seen this book in a as part of a trend uh, 
um, about how the North could deal with integrating the South back into the Union, as almost as though the South was some kind of a bride that had to be um, courted and wedded back to bring her into the Union once again. So it was a sort of um, um, matrimonial metaphor. Um, and that um, is, uh, there's a really good book about that subject, The Romance of Reunion, uh, by an historian named Nina Silber. Um, <clears throat> but that formula only goes so far because Lily Ravenel is, I mean, she's not a representative of hardcore Southern race, race prejudice or, um, I mean, there, there are, there's no conversion of Southerners to a Northern point of view. I mean, the, the, the civilians of New Orleans hate the Yankee soldiers from the beginning to the end. Um, so the South, by the end of the book, the South is not reconciled to the North whatsoever. I mean, it ends right after um, the, uh, the fall of, uh, you know, Appomattox. And uh, so it, it's a sort of a, a metaphor that is of limited value in sort of plotting out the, the sort of symbolic context for the book. Um, I think... I read an article about how the the title of the book is sort of a uh, borrows from uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. <clears throat> so Lily Ravenel is sort of the a Christian who's going from the city of destruction to the to the um, heavenly city, um, and she has to go through all these um, symbolic struggles and challenges. Uh, I think the the metaphor is is interesting. I don't know how well it holds up. Um, it is a kind of a cumbersome title. Um, I think maybe the title was used by DeForest as a hook to gain female readership because I think it's a very inviting title for a young woman who wants to pick up a book about the Civil War um, if it's focused on her um, domestic uh, life. Um, because the big books of the 1850s were domestic novels by women. Um, so it might have been a marketing device. Um, it's, it's sort of advertising how the book sort of takes you into the ideology of the South and slavery, um, how it takes a conversion experience to sort of deprogram yourself from uh, sympathies with the South to finally realizing how uh, misguided their cause was so I think you could you could look at it from um, two or three different perspectives that all might be valid I think it is effective in that way it's sort of following the the conscience of Miss Ravenel yeah. as she makes this transition I think it is very effective in that way as a I like the way that you put it a deprogramming device yeah yeah, and I, I, you know, I like her as a character. People, I've read academics say that Colburn and Lily are sort of trite, conventional lovers, but I found the love scenes uh, and the whole romantic story quite realistic and not at all schmaltzy, not idealized. It was really describing what it was like to be in love with someone who... You know, you're trying to get a feel on what they're what they think about you, and uh, um, the 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 whole you know genteel world that they belong to. There are all kinds of codes about what you can say and you can't say. Um, so I I find the love story quite moving and and quite beautiful, uh, and of course it has a happy ending, um, and. Uh, so uh, I like the fact that it's it's got some very pure-minded characters and some really wonderful um, examples of, of uh, you know human honesty and integrity and Colburn and Lily and then you have Larue Miss Larue yeah or rather Madame Larue and C Carter who is sort of corrupt and and liable to temptation and and they kind of show that the book is not a silly romantic saga, that 
Yeah. Besides the wartime descriptions, there are people out there who either are easily moved to temptation. I mean, the one of the big themes of the book we haven't even mentioned is alcohol. I mean, DeForest is really good about showing how uh, alcohol is just ruins this guy's life. You know, there's so much drinking in the military. You know, some of these generals and officers just spend half their time drunk, um, whether they're fighting or not. I mean, getting ready for battle or celebrating victories. Uh, so Carter is, is really liable to temptation. And, and Madame LaRue is interesting because she's not... I mean, she has a she has a little bit of conscience because she breaks off her relationship with Carter after Lily gives birth to a child because she sees it's really not fair for her to be involved with this guy who now has to be a, a husband and a father. But she had no no problem kind of seducing him and then having an affair with him for a few weeks. Um, so. She's a kind of fascinating character in that she's so corrupt, but on the other hand, she she's not totally corrupt. She has she has some certain certain integrity to her that is there in spite of her, you know, female egotism. And uh, so um, that's another plus about the book is is just showing the the broad view of human nature. You know, the purity and the corruption. Yeah. Well, would you... Would you like to say anything else in closing? I mean... Well... Or do you do you think we I covered... Just, do, I think, do, do, is there anything we didn't hit? No, I just... I think we've covered most of what's important. I would just... I mean, I what I'd done was I wrote down some uh, page numbers to read aloud... <laughs> From oh. the book, but I we can't do that because that takes way too too much time. But it's well, just well, why don't why don't you why don't you pick one to very uh, to, to very thoughtfully close out our discussion? Yeah, and, and leave them wanting more so that they go and they find a copy and. Okay, well, I tell you what, I'll just since we were just talking about Madame Larue, I mean, I marked down passages describing combat and about discussions of slavery. Um, but since we've just been talking about Madame LaRue, I'll just, I'll just read this passage. I mean, I, I really, I think there are dozens of places where you could just pause and say, that, you know, it was so well said, you know. Uh, so he's writing here about Madame LaRue in the midst of this affair. Mrs. LaRue was a curious study. Her views and virtues, for she had both, were all instinctive, without a taint of education or effort. She did just what she liked to do, unchecked by conscience or by anything but prudence. She was as corrupt as possible without self-reproach and as amiable as possible without self-restraint. Her ser serenity was at all at times <clears throat> as unrippled as was that of Lily in her happiest conditions. Her temper was so sunny, her smile so ready, and her manner so flattering that few persons of the male sex could resist liking her. But she was the detestation of most of the lady acquaintances, uh, I'm sorry, most of her lady acquaintances, who were venomously jealous of her attractions, or rather seductions, and abhorred her for the unscrupulous manner in which she put them to use, abusing her in a way which was enough to make a man, man rally a man rally to her rescue <clears throat> she really cared little for that divin sens du jeunesse um that means the divine sense of humanity concerning which she prattled so freely to her inmates uh, or intimates rather and therefore she was cool and sure in her coquetries at the same time that vanity gave her motive force, which some naughty flirts derive from passion. She took pride in making conquests of men at no matter what personal sacrifice. So it just shows that she's not immoral, but she's corrupt. I mean, she has a conscience. So there's a really nice balance there. She's not a transparently evil character. Um, and that's, I think, shows the sort of humanity and compassion of the author and that he's describing human beings in a, in a very kind of well-rounded way.
So I'll just end with that. Well, it's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook, for joining yeah. me again in our conversations. Uh, do you want? We've already intended to discuss another Melville story. Do you want? Do you want to make an announcement about that? Or yeah, well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk about Benito Serino, Melville's well-known story of 1854, 1855. So it'll take us back before the Civil War uh, to the slavery crisis. So stay tuned, download the Noetic app. I will have this probably edited up in the morning and uh, just check back for future conversations with Dr. Cook. You can subscribe to the Noetic YouTube channel and SoundCloud uh, to get regular updates there. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Cook. Yeah, thank you.